Now we're going to look at the second event in skeletal muscle contraction, which is excitation contraction coupling. This is where we're going to link the electrical events at the sarcolemma that we just saw with the next event, which is contraction. So there are four steps here. These are steps six through nine. So excitation contraction coupling requires action potentials. That's why we bothered to do the first five steps. We needed the action potentials. Don't forget the action potentials are the traveling depolarizations along a cell membrane. This is caused by that domino effect of the voltage-gated ion channels opening. Action potentials are needed because they cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you recall, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a modified form of the endoplasmic reticulum and it stores calcium. And calcium is absolutely necessary for contraction. So these are the four steps in excitation contraction coupling. So we're continuing off of our previous numbering system. So um, number six is the spread of the action potential down the T-tubules. Seven is the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Eight is the binding of the calcium to troponin. And nine is the exposure of active sites on actin. So let's take a look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So here in this picture, we can see the spreading of the action potential down the T-tubules. So this is the cell membrane or sarcolemma of our muscle fiber. And don't forget the T-tubules are just areas where the sarcolemma dips and goes into the fiber. So this is a T-tubule here. The yellow area, excuse me, the yellow arrow is indicating our action potential. So the action potential is traveling across the sarcolemma, including the sarcolemma that is the T-tubule. So the action potential is traveling down the T-tubule. If you look closely, right next door to the T-tubules in blue, we see sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, what happens is calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Essentially, the, um, when the T-tubule experiences the depolarization from the action potential, this causes the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum to um, unplug these plugs that are in the SR, and now the calcium can leak out. And to show you this in a little bit more detail, I have a little animation. Actually, before I show you the animation, let me show you this picture. This is showing you the plugs that I mentioned. Um, in this picture here, this membrane is supposed to be the T-tubule membrane. Over here in green, this is the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this would be inside of our muscle fiber. Okay. Um, you can see how we have this purple thing in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This purple thing is a calcium channel. But right now, right now the calcium channel is plugged. Right? When an action potential travels down the T-tubule membrane, the plug is pulled out, and that will allow calcium to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and enter into the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm would be here. Right? So to kind of clarify, this is the T-tubule membrane. This here would be the cytoplasm, or sarcoplasm as we would call it. This is the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this would be inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there's all sorts of calcium in there, and if you could unplug this, then the calcium can come out. It doesn't go out of the cell, it goes out into the cytoplasm. But this is a little animation that I created to kind of show you this idea. So here you can see our T-tubule, right? So this is inside the muscle fiber over here, and this is also inside the muscle fiber over here. So the action potential travels down the T-tubule, and that will cause the unplugging of the calcium channel. So those pink things that just moved, those are the, the, the plugs that were in our calcium channels. So here's a calcium channel right here. It's now unplugged. And so now the calcium can simply diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium just follows its concentration gradient, going from an area of high concentration inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum to an area of low concentration outside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so one more time, here comes our action potential that unplugs the calcium channels, and now the calcium can diffuse out. The next step, step number eight, is the binding of calcium to troponin. Right? If you recall, troponin is the, the thing that kind of looks like a yellow Kong toy in this picture. Troponin is part of the thin filament. The three proteins to the thin filament are actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. When the calcium leaves the SR and goes into the cytoplasm, it binds to troponin. Right? Normally, the job of troponin is to hold this white thing here, tropomyosin. 
Its job is to hold the tropomyosin on top of active sites on actin. But when calcium comes in and binds to troponin, the troponin moves just a little bit, and when the troponin moves just a little bit, it pulls the tropomyosin with it. And the tropomyosin now moves off of the active sites on actin, and now the active sites are revealed. So in this picture here, the, the top picture is showing you what the thin filament looks like when there is no calcium present. And the bottom picture shows you what the thin filament looks like in the presence of calcium. It looks very different, and the only thing that caused this really is the release of calcium. Step number nine is the exposure of the active sites on actin. I kind of included that a little bit with step eight, so I apologize. Um, so you need to have these active sites exposed on actin because what's going to happen next is myosin is going to grab on to these active sites on actin. So the third and last event of muscle contraction um, is the actual contraction event itself. These are steps 10 through 13. Our myofilaments are going to move um, leading to contraction. So during this event, we're actually going to see the sliding of filaments, hence the sliding filament theory. And during this event, myosin, myosin is going to pull on actin, producing the movement of contraction. And this requires ATP. So these are the four steps of contraction, again, uh, continuing off the previous numbering system. Step number 10 is called the cocking of the myosin head. Um, step number 11 is the formation of cross bridges. Step number 12 is the pivoting of the myosin head. And step number 13 is the detachment of the cross bridge. Um, these are cyclic steps, so they keep happening over and over again until we run out of something like um, some sort of limiting resource like space or ATP or calcium. Also, make sure you pay attention to what's happening to ATP, ADP, and inorganic phosphate in each of these steps. So in step 10, we have the, the cocking of the myosin head. It's also called the positioning step. Basically, what we're doing is we're getting myosin in the right exact place um, so that it can bind onto actin. So when things get started, the myosin head is sort of bent over its own tail. So see how there's a strong angle here? Right? The myosin head is bent over its own tail. Right? We don't want it to be like that, though. It can't grab onto actin when it's like that. So what we need to do is we need to move the myosin head this way. But to do that, we have to have some energy, and we're going to hydrolyze ATP. We're going to break down ATP. So when ATP undergoes hydrolysis on the myosin head, the myosin head is able to pivot into the proper position. Notice that the myosin is now in a completely different position, and notice that the ATP is not there anymore, but the ADP and the phosphate are present. So when the ATP undergoes hydrolysis, we end up with ADP and inorganic phosphate. And those are still there, they're still stuck to the myosin head. Down on the bottom, you, you see a little animation that's going to continue through the next few slides, and it's showing you what's happening with the myosin um, during these, these four steps of contraction. Uh, step number 11 is formation of the cross bridge. So this is when the myosin actually grabs onto the actin. As soon as the myosin heads are lined up, as soon as they go through that cocking step, um, they will shoot up and just bind right onto the active sites on actin. Um, it's, it's sort of a, an electrostatic interaction. So what causes the, the, I keep pointing at my screen like you can see my finger, what causes the myosin head to want to grab onto the actin is that there's an electrical interaction here. You can think of it this way. This isn't exactly correct, but you can think of it this way. Like there's a bunch of minuses on the myosin head and a bunch of pluses on the actin, and they naturally just want to come together. Um, so this ATP picture right here is not correct, but this is the correct one that when the myosin grabs onto the actin, notice that the ADP and inorganic phosphate are still present. Step number 12 is the pivoting of the myosin head. Right after myosin grabs onto actin, myosin pivots, pulling on the actin. We sometimes call this the power stroke. Um, during this process, the ADP and the phosphate are kicked off of the myosin head. So notice in the picture, the ADP and the phosphate are no longer on the myosin head, 
and these arrows are showing you that the, the actin has been pulled in this direction. So the myosin pulled the actin that direction. That's our power stroke. So now what we have to do is we have to have myosin let go of the actin so that the myosin can grab onto another actin further down the line and pull. But myosin does not like to let go of actin. That is a really strong electrostatic interaction between them. So if you want to break that cross bridge, if you want to break the bond between actin and myosin, you better be ready to supply energy. So a new ATP molecule comes in and binds to the myosin head. And that's what breaks the cross bridge. Right? Notice the ATP is not hydrolyzed in this step. The ATP is still ATP. The ATP coming in and binding to the myosin head is what causes the cross bridge to break. In the picture down here, we see a sarcomere, right? And you can see the sarcomere shortening. And that's what happens during these uh, steps 10 through 13 is we, we, we shorten that sarcomere. The last four steps of contraction, the ones we just looked at, are repeated continuously until the muscle fiber runs out of something, like calcium or ATP or space. Now the, the sarcomeres can only shorten so much. Once the, um, once the thin filaments get all the way to the center of the sarcomere, then there's no more place to move so we can run out of space in this process. Um, the picture we've been looking at showed just one myosin grabbing onto one actin and pulling during contraction, but in reality, millions upon millions of myosin proteins are grabbing and pulling onto millions of actin proteins, and that's just in one cell. And just so you know, it's not the case that um, during muscle contraction that every myosin is grabbing and pulling onto actin at the same time. What I mean by that is one myosin might be in the middle of the cocking step, while another myosin is in the middle of the pulling step, while another myosin is in the middle of the letting go step. So the myosins are all doing different things. There's always a hand on the rope. There's always at least one myosin holding on to the thin filament. Take a minute and pause the video and see if you can fill in these blanks on your own. All right, see if you got them. So the myosin heads bind to actin, forming cross bridges. Then the myosin heads pull, pulling on the actin. Actin is attached to the sarcolemma and the endomysium via costomeres, including dystrophin protein. Endomysium is connected to tendons, and tendons are connected to bones. So when actin is moved, what else is moved? Well, these Costomeres are moved, the sarcolemma is moved, the endomysium is moved, tendons are moved, but most importantly, bones are moved, and this is how we move our bones. The last thing that happens in muscle contraction is relaxation. Um, so I shouldn't say this is the last thing that happens in muscle contraction because this is what happens after muscles contract, right? is relaxation. And this occurs when there is no nerve fiber stimulus coming in, right? Essentially what happens is we lose step number one. And if you remember, step number one was the nerve signal arrives. But now that's gone. We're no longer sending a nerve signal to the skeletal muscle fiber. So because there's no more nerve um, signal, the calcium levels in the sarcoplasm, or the, the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber, if you will, begin to fall. Okay. Um, Calcium will detach from troponin, and troponin will shift back into its old position. Okay. Um, and when troponin shifts back into its old position, it pulls tropomyosin with it. And now the active sites on actin are going to be covered once again by the tropomyosin. And if the active sites are covered on the actin, then the cross bridges can't form and contraction cannot occur. I really like these two pictures because they, they explain a contraction and relaxation both very nicely.